Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Kelly Pirtle with NOAA Communications in Norman, Oklahoma, and I'm your host for today's webinar. Uh, this is the first time we have hosted a virtual event to kick off a field campaign, and we're so excited about today and all that we're going to share with you. Um, the Perils Project also, that's an acronym, of course. Um, the Propagation, Evolution, and Rotation in Linear Storms Experiment. So, perils. We will cover the overall goals and how it will work, as well as share information about some of the instruments our researchers will deploy. And we want to answer your questions. I am so excited for these presentations and hope you will enjoy them. Perils is a three-year project with a total cost of more than $9 million funded by NOAA and the National Science Foundation. Some of the researchers have spent the winter scouting the perfect locations to place their instruments to gather data and learn more about tornadoes in the Southeast United States. The ultimate goal of this project is very simple, to save lives and property. Today's webinar is kind of like a virtual open house each of our panelists will have up to five minutes and three slides to cover their topic. You can see from the outline, after each group, we will take a break for questions from you, our audience. And at the end, all of the panelists will return to respond to your questions for the last few minutes. At any point during the presentations, please submit your questions in writing using the questions pane of the GoToWebinar panel. Alan Gerard, Chief of the Warning Research and Development Division at the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory, will be gathering your questions and sharing them with our presenters. We are recording today's webinar, and it will be posted soon on the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory's Perils webpage. That's www.nssl.noaa.gov slash projects slash perils. And for reporters, listen up. We will have a link to B-roll on that page as well. So I'll repeat the webpage, www.nssl.noaa.gov slash projects slash perils. And we also have photos of, on NSSL's Flickr page. So you can get to that from the main lab webpage, nssl.noaa.gov, and scroll to the bottom for the link. Finally, we'd love to get your feedback on this event. As I said, it's the first time we've done it. So please take a moment at the conclusion of today's webinar to complete a very brief survey. Now let's get started. Uh, we're going to start our webinar with an overview of perils given by the person who is coordinating all of NOAA's involvement in the project. Tony Liza is a postdoc at the Cooperative Institute for Severe and High Impact Weather Research and Operations here in Norman, also known as CERO, and he's working with the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory. His research experience includes investigating the role of terrain on severe storm environments, observational analysis of tornado producing quasi-linear convective storms or QLCSs, something you're going to hear a lot more about, and tornado damage analysis. His research has focused on tornadoes that occur in the southeast United States. Tony, are you ready? Sure am. Thank you so much, Kelly. So as uh, Kelly introduced, uh, Perils is a project that focuses on tornadoes that form within lines of storms, or the technical term we use in meteor the meteorological community is quasi-linear convective systems. So one such example can be seen on uh, the image to the right there, where you see in the circled areas two tornadoes that are embedded within a longer line of storms that occurred north of Tupelo, Mississippi, back on December 16, 2019. Data collection for the Perils Project will take up uh, two spring seasons across the Southeast. Uh, the first uh, data collection will begin uh, this coming week, uh, March 1st through April 30th of 2022, and then there will be a leg in 2023 from February 8th to May 8th. So this is a total of five months of data collection, and then uh, there will be at least another year of data analysis and, and research uh, conducted by most groups afterwards. The domain for perils is expansive. This is a, a large project that will investigate tornadic storms across a, a large portion of the southern and southeastern United States, extending from southeastern Missouri and the Missouri Boot Hill down the Mississippi River Valley through 
the Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana Delta regions and into the Acadiana region, the Atchafalaya River Basin in South Central Louisiana, and then extending eastward across the Tennessee Valley region of North Alabama and Southern Middle Tennessee, and the Black Belt region from Northeast and East Central Mississippi and into Central Alabama, extending about to Montgomery, Alabama. So why are we going, why are we doing perils? What is the, the big thrust? What is the reason for, for conducting this research and what is the focus? Three main themes can be identified in terms of the research that we uh, intend to accomplish in this project. The first is looking at the environments ahead of storms. At any given location, as a line of potentially tornadic thunderstorms approaches, how is the environment changing within about six to eight hours uh, upon the, the approach of that line? And then when the line of storms gets there, how does the environment immediately out ahead of it change from one part of the line to another? And can that tell us something about the potential for a given part of that line of storms uh, to have the potential produce tornadoes versus another part that might not? And then when we look at the storms themselves, how do the temperature and humidity and, and wind uh, characteristics of these storms vary along the lines? How do the updrafts and the downdrafts within the line impact the ability for circulations to form? How do these circulations produce tornadoes? Do all, you know, what proportion of circulations produce tornadoes within the line? And can we identify which circulations are likely to produce tornadoes and which are not? And then the third leg of perils, the third main theme, is looking at the aftermath, investigating how much of the wind damage in association with lines of storms is actually attributable to tornadoes. And are there effects that the land cover or the structures that are impacted along a tornado's track might have in terms of the damage that occurs downstream or in the surrounding area? So when you look at these together, it's a kind of a seamless garment of, across the three themes of looking at the environment ahead of the storms, looking at the storms themselves, and then looking at the aftermath that's left behind. So when you look at all the equipment and all the, the, the resources that we put into this, it really tells one coherent story. If we could go on to the next slide. This is a tremendously large field campaign. This is the largest tornado-related field project since Vortex 2. There will be over 100 mobile and fixed instrument platforms deployed over dozens of locations. Some will be combined together and some will be spaced out separately um, in similar, uh, similar configurations to the map that you see on the right side of the screen there. There will be about 70 to 75 uh, personnel per mission in the field collecting data during perils and this once the instruments are put out in the field most of them will stay in place for the duration of a severe weather event across whichever area we're focusing on for that specific storm system so this is not necessarily a chasing project for most of the equipment but having those long-term series of data before during and, and immediately after the storms and then going out the day after, several days after, and looking at the damage that is caused, again, produces that full story of what happened during a given severe weather event before, during, and after the passage of storms in, in the area impacted in the area that we're studying. And so I'll go ahead and pass it back to Kelly. Thank you, Tony. It's a very good inter overview. So, uh, next, we are going to uh, Eric Rasmussen. He is a research scientist at the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory and a leading expert on mesoscale meteorology. Uh, he's been doing this a while. He led tornado studies uh, uh, starting in the mid-90s with the first Vorte Vortex project and has been a lead principal investigator for the Vortex 2 projects in 2009 and 2010, and then Vortex Southeast since 2016. He also developed an important system that researchers use for situational awareness and communication during these types of tornado studies that involve a lot of participants. It's hard to imagine a tornado research project happening without Eric's involvement. Go ahead, Eric. Thank you, Kelly, for, those, for that introduction. 
So I've been asked to uh, say a few words today about why we're studying these tornadoes in the Southeast United States. And so I'd like you to look at that map on the left-hand side of the screen. It shows where the risk is largest for, for damaging tornadoes in the United States. And one thing you can notice is, is that risks are pretty comparable between Oklahoma and the Southeast United States. They both get similar amounts of damaging tornadoes. But historically, we've studied the tornadoes pretty much only in the Great Plains. And, and that's simply because in the Great Plains, there is a, a dense network of roads. It's flat and fairly treeless. You can sight radars. The storms move slowly and are very visible. So it, it's always been easiest to study the tornadoes in, this, in the central US. But you, you, if you look at the map on the right, that shows where people are most likely to die in tornadoes. And now you can see that the threat for, for killer tornadoes shifts over to the Southeast US, primarily Alabama and Mississippi and Tennessee. And, and so back in about 2015, Congress asked NOAA and the National Science Foundation to start taking a look at this issue of the tornadoes in the Southeast US and why is there an outsized, outsized risk there? And in response in NOAA, we started doing a series of small experiments in that region just to understand you know, what the, the difficult logistics might be to do observational science there and what the special problems would be that we weren't accustomed to addressing in the central U.S. Of course, a lot of the, a lot of this risk for tornado, for, for deaths in the southeast has to do with things, not just the weather, but social and behavioral issues about how people receive warnings, how they respond to them, what's the best way to communicate the information to them and those sorts of things. But obviously, there's some meteorological problems intertwined in all of that. And so that gave rise to this program for, called Vortex Southeast. And all of our little experiments of the last five years have taught us what we think we need to do to get to the field and really make some big gains in our understanding. And so in the next slide, this slide illustrates the variety of storms that we're dealing with in the Southeast US. And if you're familiar with Tornado, tornadic storms at all, in those lower right-hand panels, the bottom right-hand ones, you'll see what we call the classic supercells. That's a storm that a lot of people are familiar with. And they're familiar with it mainly because we've observed these for now a few decades in the plains and we understand them pretty well. But in the upper panels and the left-hand side, there are a variety of storms there that we're just not used to looking at. We just don't have much understanding of them. And as you can see, they're organized sort of in lines or bands. And so that's the emphasis of this new project called Perils. Um, so not only do we not understand these storms and how they produce tornadoes, but we're pretty sure it's pretty unlike those classic supercells. But how do the conditions develop that are favorable for these storms? One thing we do know is that in the lower part of the atmosphere, say the lowest 5,000 feet or so, we get these big surges of wind ahead of these storms that sort of sets the stage to develop the spin but it happens completely differently in the Southeast US than it does in the Plains. And so these differences lead to you know, dif difficulties in forecasting and warning. For example, uh, the conditions favorable for tornadoes in the Southeast happen throughout the year and, and unexpectedly happen in the cool season like November, December, when uh, you know, even at the holidays, like uh, you can have these tornadic storms as we just experienced uh, in the Mid-South in December. So people aren't really aware that they might be threatened by tornadic storms during the cool season of the year. Likewise, at nighttime, a lot of tornadoes in the Southeast happen in the middle of the night. That's something that people aren't generally aware of. That's something we don't completely understand how it happens, something that we haven't studied before in the Great Plains. And, and so all of this leads to the fact, that these lacks, lack of understanding leads to the fact that our forecast rules that we use to predict the tornadoes and warn for them don't apply terribly well in the Southeast. And that gives, that's, that gives the big motivation for this experiment we're talking about today called Perils. And that's all I have for you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we're going to go to questions now. So um, we'll take a few minutes and please submit your um, reminder, please submit your questions uh, in the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. I'll now turn it over to Alan. Sorry, I got to turn my mic on. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so we have a couple of questions in the in the Q and A box, and the two questions are essentially the same, and they basically boil down to 
why uh, the Perils domain stops along the Alabama-Georgia border and does not extend into Georgia. And I'll let Tony answer that. Uh, it's a, a very, very straightforward answer. Um, Georgia has lots of trees. It's a very highly forested state across most of the state. And it's very difficult to place mobile radars there. When placing mobile radar instrumentation, we need a clear line of sight for some distance in order for the lowest levels of the radar beam to be able to reach over the tree line. And so it's not that we have any desire to not operate in Georgia. It's just that the, the amount of forested areas, forest coverage across the state makes would make it very, very difficult to, to perform mobile operations there. Um, we have a question about, um, can someone be hired to help with the project? Uh, you, would a PhD student be interested? I, I will answer that question and say that we would potentially be interested depending on where you're at and um, uh, um, what your expertise is. Um, I would say uh, you can reach out uh, uh, to myself, uh, alan.e.gerard at noaa.gov, and I'd be glad to um, try to figure something out. Um, let's see. Uh, the, we have an, a question from the Lincoln County Emergency Management saying that they had been contacted in the past about uh, potentially uh being a uh, site in their county uh I, i'm assuming he means uh, some sort of a observation site is this still an option or site i don't know if eric or tony knows the answer to that i i know there were a couple potential radar sites that were scouted in lincoln county um at, at, ahead of this project I don't believe we'll be placing any mobile radars in Lincoln County, but it's certainly possible that some mobile profiling systems may end up there. Uh, so potentially, yes. And then uh, one last, there's, there's, there are two questions that are kind of similar. Um, I think there are good ones to probably uh, wrap this section up on is, um, how uh, how did the findings from the first five years of Vortex Southeast help um, guide what we're doing uh, with perils? I think I could take a stab at that. So the, one of the primary things we've been trying to do is figure out um, couple of things. One, one is what kind of weather systems are we dealing with? Like I, I said in my talk, we know there, there are systems unlike what we've seen in the plains. So it took us a few years of observing those systems to gain a good sense of what kind of instruments we would need to deploy to improve our understanding. And then just the experience in learning how to site instruments like, like the mobile Doppler radars, you know, finding the open areas where the trees aren't blocking the beams and, and how to do the radar scanning. Those are sort of, uh, I think, to me, the biggest chunks of things we've learned in, in our initial few years that are that have really uh, been a big benefit to planning the Perils project. Tony, would yeah, you add anything? Yeah, I'd just like to add, like Eric said, I, I think a lot of it has been a learning experience for our field as a whole, learning how to learning how to learn, honestly, in the Southeast United States. Um, the, the, the objectives, as, as I mentioned in my last slide, this is not necessarily a chasing project. Once instruments are placed, they're going to be placed. This isn't like Vortex 2 or Vortex where you have an armada moving along to target a single storm. We're going to be setting most of our armada up within a set area about 50 to 60 miles long and about 40 miles wide. And then we'll have a couple instruments that move around within that, but by and large, most of the instruments are going to stay in place. And so it's been learning how to optimize where we place those instruments that are going to stay in place and what instruments can move around, what degree to which they can move around within that and targeting an area and an environment instead of targeting a storm 
that I think has been one of the biggest learning experiences and how to do that that came out of the first five years of Vortex Southeast. All right, thanks, Tony and Eric. Uh, excellent questions. We have a couple more questions that I think will be answered by later uh, pres presenters. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Kelly to move us through our uh, program. Thank you, Alan, and uh, glad that we're getting a lot of questions. I love it. Um, our uh, uh, next presenter is known as Dr. Doppler, and I think it really fits. Mike Biggerstaff became interested in radar observations of thunderstorms at age five, watching displays of lo the local weather radar in Dallas during TV broadcasts. He informed his parents he was going to be a meteorologist and started taking weather observations at home. His interest in studying storms led him from being a student at the University of Texas to being a professor at the University of Oklahoma and director of the Shared Mobile Atmospheric Research and Teaching, or SMART, radars administered by CRO, the Cooperative Institute. He has led radar deployments in more than 40 federally funded research projects, including 15 landfalling hurricanes. Mike, tell us about the radars involved in perils. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Kelly. Uh, I think uh, the first slide of the presentation will show a picture of uh, several or all the mobile radars that are gonna be involved. And as uh, Dr. Liza and Dr. Rasmussen said, this project is really about studying tornadoes in the Southeast. And, and those tornadoes tend to be small and short-lived events that are, that are not as deep as what we see in the Central Plains. And uh, so the best way I think to observe the processes that lead to the formation of these tornadoes is to use Doppler weather radars. Now, the National Weather Service has a, a network of, of, of Doppler radars around the southeastern United States that provides a really nice broad scale view of the storms as it moves through the environment. But we need to be able to see the, the really small circulations at very high temporal resolutions. And so we're bringing to bear all the available uh, research radars that, that uh, can be used for a project like this. So there's eight of them that we're going to take out to the field. Uh, three of them are actually from the University of Oklahoma. One is a rapid scanning radar that is operated by the Advanced Radar Research Center. Uh, and then we have two radars that are part of the Cooperative Institute for Severe and High Impact Weather Research and Operations, or CERO. And uh, in addition to that, we have two radars from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, one of those is actually a relatively new radar that uses a very large dish to, uh, to be able to achieve a narrower beam, so looking at even high resolution at a longer wavelength uh, that, that uh, helps being able to see through the storms through wet hail and heavy rain. And then uh, we also have a, a radar from uh, the National Severe Storms Lab, and we have a radar from the University of Alabama Huntsville. And then finally, we have a radar that is uh, being used to test new technology. And this one is from Stony Brook University. It's called the Skylar 2 radar, and it's a phased array system. Uh, and that is unique in the sense that we, we won't be um, spanning the antenna. We'll be actually using the electronics to move the radar beam along. So that allows us to move it really fast. And instead of taking several minutes to sample the atmosphere, we can do it in 30 seconds. So that's a new technology that's coming through the pipeline uh, in the future, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll go into the operational uh, networks in the future as well. So we're kind of testing out these field campaigns. Now, uh, in addition to the uh, radars, I, I, I think in the next slide, you'll see why we need all these uh, radars. So in the second slide, we have um, a, an image that shows a conceptual model of the formation of tornadoes. And there's this outflow from downdrafts that is really important to pushing the gust front forward in, a, in a, some part of the storm system. So you kind of have a little surge in the gust front and that then leads to a, a region of shear and that shear can be lifted by an updraft and that produces a rotating column of air. And if that rotating column of air gets stretched and amplified, then it actually can spin up to a to tornado uh, strength uh, circulation. And all those processes occur in these quasi-linear convective systems, or QLCSs. All that occurs in the lowest 5,000 to 6,000 feet. 
And, and so it's a really shallow part of the atmosphere that we're having to observe. And as the second image uh, to the right on the second slide uh, shows, the radar beams gain altitude with the range. So because of the Earth's curvature, a radar beam doesn't stay close to the ground for very long. It gains altitude as we go further and further away from the radar. So if we need to be able to see the lowest part of the atmosphere, we have to do it with a network of, of radar. So we need a lot of radars that are closely spaced together, which is why we're taking these eight mobile radars out in the field. And finally, the third slide is, what are we trying to do with, uh, with these radars? And so uh, I'm showing you there an example of uh, a storm that came through northern Louisiana in 2018 that produced two tornadoes. And the contours are, are of the circulation that's leading to the formation of the tornadoes. And what we're trying to do with all these radars is to identify and track the small, rapidly evolving vortices, determine the physical processes that lead to tornadoes, relate the tornado processes to aspects of the storm that is observable with the operational net network, because we want to take our research operations and actually come up with ways that the operational network can detect these circulations with a broader brush view than what we're able to achieve with the research radar. So we're going to we're going to do the research to operations part of this as well, and eventually improve the ability to warn for those smaller, short-lived but deadly tornadic storms. And with that, I turn it back to uh, to Kelly. Thank you very much, Mike. All right, we will um, go on to our next speaker. Uh, Kevin Nupp is a professor in the Department of Atmospheric and Earth Science at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. He manages the Mobile Atmospheric Profiling Network, MapNet, which consists of three profiling systems and one polar, polarimetric scanning radar. Dr. Nupp's research interests include mesoscale and boundary layer processes associated with severe storms. And uh, Kevin and UAH uh, and NSSL and NOAA have been working together uh, for several years now on storms, uh, especially in the southeast. Kevin, tell us more. Okay, thank you, Kelly. If we go to the, the next slide. Uh, what is a profiler? That's the question. So what do they do? Well, a profiler is an instrument that measures uh, specific quantities such as wind, temperature, moisture, clouds, and precipitation along a line. And typically we think of, of profilers as measuring the vertical variation of those quantities in the atmosphere. In the middle frame, top middle section there, is a schematic of how profilers work. Um, so for the uh, wind profilers, whether they're radar-based or LIDAR-based, LIDAR is really laser uh, light that is used. Uh, they send out uh, uh, radiation along multiple beams, uh, the vertical beam and then off vertical beams to build up a horizontal wind profile. And you'll note there in uh, the relative size difference between a radar beam, which is wide, and a LIDAR beam, which is really narrow. In perils, uh, as shown in the top right uh, window, uh, we'll have six mobile profiling units. Three of those are radar-based, 915 megahertz, and three are, are LIDAR-based, uh, short uh, infrared light. And then uh, fixed site profilers are also shown there, uh, and those include uh, two different frequencies for radars, 449 megahertz and 915 megahertz, and then two other multi-instrument systems that will be talked about in a, in a later talk. So an example of a mobile system is shown in the bottom left. That's the mobile integrated profiling system, and that has four, in, four primary instruments on board that measure these things that I'm talking about. Lower right shows a fixed base profiler uh, located in northern Alabama. If we move to the next slide, we'll look at some measurements that profilers provide. So the upper left panel shows a sequence of uh, wind profiles spaced at five minute intervals over a one hour time period. And that basically shows that winds increase in strength with height. 
the plotting convention here is that most of the winds show a southwesterly flow, wind from the southwest. At low levels, you see uh, the, a wind shift uh, around 110 uh, UTC, universal time, and that wind shift represents an important boundary that played a role in tornado genesis for this particular case uh, about a month ago. In the lower left is uh, a quantity called, we call that storm relative velocity. Uh, that's a measure of uh, the, the way winds turn and increase in speed with height. The storm relative velocity has been shown to be a key ingredient in tornado genesis. And in this particular plot, uh, the red line shows a 100% increase in the value of that SRH in 30 minutes, which is really quite extreme. The upper right uh, panel shows uh, high resolution measurements acquired by a, a LIDAR system showing the turbulence in a boundary layer. Uh, that's important because greater turbulent intensity reduces the, the, ver the, the, rap the uh, uh, vertical shear of the wind. Uh, that's how rapidly the, the shear or the wind speed will increase with height. Finally, in the bottom right is a time height section of reflectivity from a profiler as a QLCS passed over it. And that shows strong updrafts. Um, you see a W equal 23 meters per second there. That's, a, that's an updraft of, of uh, about 51 miles per hour. And then as this system passed over, there's a leading gust front as labeled there and a secondary outflow surge, both of which played an important role in this particular QLCS. Uh, the, the next slide shows the importance or alludes to the importance of clouds in this particular environment in the Southeast. Uh, stratocumulus clouds are what, they, what they're called, are quite prominent in the Southeast uh, during severe storm situations. Uh, in this case, we see a stratocumulus cloud field uh, that has texture in both the uh, small cloud elements and then bands of clouds that relate somehow to the structure of the low levels in, in the atmosphere. So in summary, if we moved on, move on to the final slide, um, measurements of the vertical and temporal variation of the wind as acquired from profiling systems um, of the measure of the variation of the wind, temperature, moisture, clouds, precipitation, and those measurements uh, acquired at time scales as short as two or three seconds to five minutes will contribute to our understanding of the boundary layer and the environment that uh, sets up in advance of these potentially tornadic uh, quasi-linear convective systems. And that concludes my talk. Thank you so much, Kevin. Our, um, our, our next speaker, is Elizabeth Smith. Elizabeth joined the National Severe Storms Laboratory as a research meteorologist a couple years ago, and we think she's the youngest uh, um, science, uh, federal scientist within uh, NOAA research. She focuses her uh, research on the boundary layer, the space just above the ground where temperature, moisture, and wind affect storms and even tornadoes. She has developed and deployed boundary layer profiling systems, including CLAMPS, the Collaborative Lower Atmospheric Mobile Profiling System, which she will tell us more about today. In her spare time, Elizabeth volunteers at the National Weather Museum and Science Center here in Norman. Elizabeth? Yeah, thank you, Kelly. And thanks for spelling out CLAMPS um, so that I don't have to. Uh, so we can go ahead and hop right in. Um, so moving forward to the next slide, um, CLAMPS is a trailer-based platform, and it is one of those profilers that uh, Dr. Nup just introduced. Uh, so it's made up of three main instruments, and it gets deployed kind of the way a camper would. Um, you push them all out. So it has Doppler wind LIDAR, which collects really high-resolution information about both the vertical velocity and the horizontal winds, and then we get those thermodynamic profiles of temperature and humidity 
by measuring the downwelling information uh, about radiance from the atmosphere. Um, so we do that with the other two instruments that are on board. So if you'll step forward, we can go from getting information like we usually do twice a day from the weather balloons that our National Weather Service launches twice a day across the country, uh, stepping forward, to information that looks like this. These are real clamps observations. On the bottom panel, you see water vapor or moisture. In the center panel, you see measurements of vertical velocity. And the top panel, you see measurements of horizontal velocity or the horizontal wind. Um, something I want to point out, though, is that line that you see traced over top of this. This is what we would call boundary layer height, or simply the measurement of how deep the layer is that is directly impacted by the Earth's surface. So um, the layer that feels the uh, friction from the Earth, for example. And I point that out because this is a product that we can create by combining all of the information from the multiple instruments together. So taking the parts and combining them to get something that is a little bit more than the pieces independently. Moving forward. But we're not just deploying clamps, we're also deploying the Copterson, which is a weather sensing uncrewed aircraft, and this is a video of it taking off. Um, the Copterson was completely designed and developed uh, at the University of Oklahoma, um, but it has been uh, approved for use on a NOAA project, and so we'll be using it um, at the clamp sites and at one more site, which I'll show you next. Um, it's quite a cool little platform. It weighs just about four and a half pounds. It's a quadcopter, as you can see. Um, it's Pretty powerful, um, horizontally can go as fast as 62 miles an hour, but we won't be doing that, we'll only be flying straight up and down. Um, we'll be flying to, for us, a max altitude of 5,000 feet, although it's capable of flying up to 10,000 feet. Um, but it'll be providing us really high resolution information about wind, temperature, uh, moisture, all of those things as it flies, stepping forward. So we'll be deploying clamps and the copter sun together at the locations where you see the little red uh, uh, drone icons, you know, you can see them. And then we'll be deploying a copter sun alone where you see a purple one. And the reason it's alone is because one, we only have two clamps, but also because we're deploying it near one of those other profiling sites that Dr. Nutt mentioned previously. And so we're gonna be combining the information from that profiling site with the copter song there. And so you can see this kind of broader, what we'd say mesoscale network across the entire domain. And then inside that, we're deploying the clamps and copter song network in a triangular shape. And so we can zoom on on that and see. And so kind of the same concept is what I was doing with that boundary layer height. We wanna see how we can combine information to, instead of using things independently, get something more out of the single pieces. So stepping forward, instead of having just one clamps and one set of information over time, we can do our research. So take all the science and all that information we can do. And hopefully over that network, provide something that's like a 3D picture of the atmosphere in space and in height. And this is not real data that we use. This is just an example of what something like that could look like. But perhaps a novel combination of our observations and the way that we can interpret that observations can be better than the parts alone and provide us more information about our atmosphere. And that's all I have. Thank you, Elizabeth. Our fourth presenter in this group is Mike Coniglio. Mike has been involved in the Vortex field campaign since Vortex 2 in 2009 and 2010. In addition, Mike works to bridge the gap between the research and operational forecasting communities by designing and evaluating severe weather forecast experiments and applications for the NOAA hazardous weather testbed. His original research interest in severe and unusual weather can be traced back to his childhood growing up in western New York and experiencing the remarkable lake effect snowstorms that grace the area every winter. 
Craving to understand and experience the severe convective weather that frequents the central U.S., he attended the University of Oklahoma for graduate school and stayed around. In 2008, Mike was selected for the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, a PCASE award, which is very prestigious. Mike, tell us more about the soundings that you'll be doing. All right, thank you for that, Kelly. So as we just saw from Dr. Nupp and Dr. Smith, uh, these ground-based profilers are they're a relatively new technology and they're an essential part of observing the atmosphere uh, very frequently. But the best way to obtain co-located high-resolution observations of the atmosphere um, over the, the full depth of the storm systems that we're going to be sampling continues to be from the tried and true practice of attaching um, a radius on to a helium filled balloon here, which is what we traditionally call a sounding of the atmosphere. So operationally, the National Weather Service has taken soundings for nearly a century now and continues to do so today. And this is because of how important they are for getting that high resolution information in a vertical profile for both diagnosing the atmosphere and also for providing valuable input into numerical models. <clears throat> and I just provided some uh, examples here for how these observations are used. Um, you know, we'll plot these data over the US that are taken twice a day, and they'll give us sort of this broad scale or what we call a synoptic scale picture of what's happening above the ground at different levels. And if we take, you know, one particular radius on observation and plot the trace of those observations along a single balloon path, we get a very detailed view of how the temperature, humidity, and winds are essentially layered above the ground. And these layered observations are particularly important for severe weather applications in, in which we derive variables from these layered profiles to provide specific clues for the types of storms and hazards that we can expect in a given environment here. So next slide. <clears throat> so in perils, um, we're certainly going to make use of this, of the, the routine radius on network when we can. Um, but given that tornadic thunderstorms occur at small and uh, space and time scales compared to the uh, national radius on network, we're going to be taking our own sound soundings to profile the atmosphere. And uh, we're going to be doing this from a lot of them. We're going to use uh, 18 of them in total uh, among all the uh, contributors to the project here. And these are going to range from the traditional radius ons that are designed uh, to rise at a rate of about a thousand feet per minute here uh, to sample the full depth of the atmosphere where storms occur in, under about, uh, in about an hour or so. But we'll also be using systems that are designed to sample more what's happening closer to the ground. And these are uh, sometimes called swarm songs or, or wind songs. And these rise, these are designed to rise at a much slower rate uh, to focus on sampling what's happening near the ground as they essentially are carried along with, with the flow, with the winds. And I think, as, as you've heard, that this is another piece of the puzzle, uh, this enhanced sampling close to the ground. Uh, uh, this is a, a, a novel and primary theme for perils here, to understand the atmospheric processes responsible for this rapid and very shallow development of rotation uh, in these thunderstorm lines. We have to understand what's happening very close to the ground here. So uh, next slide. So like for the other instrumented platforms, the uh, traditional soundings uh, shown by the, the, the red dots here, um, these will be coordinated in terms of the, the times that they're released and also in their locations in the observing domain here. So the, the generic plan is to have them spaced about 25 kilometers apart and launching soundings at intervals of 60 to 90 minutes before storms enter the, the observing domain, and then we'll decrease that frequency to about 30 to 60 minutes, or increase the frequency uh, when storms are in the primary uh, radar domain. And for, for the swarm songs, uh, the general plan here is, is to space the two vehicles that we'll have for those uh, about 30 kilometers apart. And one of the things that is novel about these is that you can launch several of these soundings 
uh, at one time and track them with one radius on system here. So we'll be releasing these uh, at intervals every four to five minutes or so and uh, basically launching them so they'll, they'll move over the observing domain. And this is to provide a direct way to sample the conditions close to the ground at very high time resolution. So uh, in all here, I'll just mention that this is the first time that such a large array of both traditional soundings uh, and these swarm songs will be used in tandem to sample multiple spatial and temporal scales uh, of these storms and their environments. So that's it, back to you, Kelly. Thank you, Mike. Um, so Mike, stay on and uh, Mike Biggerstaff, Kevin and Elizabeth join back on and we're gonna um, get to some questions. Uh, so, Alan, uh, do you have some questions for us? Well, to be honest, I don't have any questions at this point. Um, so I encourage uh, folks to submit questions in the Q&A. Um, while we're waiting to see if we can get a question, I'll, I'll just mention that in addition to the soundings that uh, Mike was discussing, and if I missed Mike saying this, I apologize, but we're also going to have special soundings from the National Weather Service being released as well. Um, there will be uh, soundings. Uh, let me put my mic down, so hopefully you can hear me a little better. There will be uh, soundings uh, released uh, every six hours when we're doing a, a uh, an operational, uh, um, excuse me, an intense observational period. So just wanted to mention that. Uh, we have another question um, that we've had. Actually, it's been a similar question from a couple of different people. Uh, will any of this data be available to operational meteorologists, weather service, or media in near real time? And similar question was asked in relation to emergency managers. So um, does someone on the panel want to take that question? Or OK, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, one of the things that we've been trying to do with our mobile radars is provide real-time data uh, from the field, especially during the hurricane landfalls. We've actually been generating uh, wind field analyses and sending those out uh, to various federal agencies, including uh, the National Hurricane Center. So uh, for this project, we certainly hope to be able to do that as well. It kind of just depends on how good the internet is in some of the areas we're going to be working. Uh, because we, we've got to have really good internet to be able to send the data back to the server at the University of Oklahoma. But it is our goal and our, and our uh, to have that available. So I, I will make that uh, website, of, uh, I will give that information to Kelly Pirtle uh, and she can uh, uh, provide that uh, information forward for anybody who's in, interested in, in the smart radar data that we're collecting in the field. Our data from CLAMPS are available in near real time um, and we do share those with the operational partners um, it's also just publicly available for anybody that's just interested in looking at it um, that website is apps so apps dot noaa or dot dot gov slash clamps c-l-a-m-p-s then it's slash c-l-a-m-p-s either one or two depending on the which one you want to look at. Um, and I'll also give that to Kelly, but we always do show visualizations of our data in real time as well. And we try to always connect with our operational partners to make sure that they are aware of where it is and when it'll be providing those data. And I'm also and putting- in, yeah. Alan, and this is Kelly. And uh, we can send out these links um, to everybody who uh, it, it has attended today, I think we'll have your email. And we, we will also add these links on the PERILS webpage on the National Sphere Storms Laboratory webpage. So that is nssl.noaa.gov slash projects slash PERILS. So look, look for that. Thank you both. So. Yeah, that's all awesome. I was also going to mention that we have a partnership with the with UCAR um, to archive and uh, 
also display some of our data that's gathered during perils in real time and they have a website as well and i'll put a link to that in the chat so there's there are several different ways to potentially get information uh, that we're uh, collecting in real time um, we had another question i think this is primarily for elizabeth wanting to know if you could give a little more information on the copper sound on how they're made uh, what sort of drone they are, et cetera. Sure, so the copter sound is completely developed and built here at the University of Oklahoma. Um, so it is all built here in house. We have an engineer, his name is Tony Sagalas, who actually did most of the work um, as part of his studies here. Um, it is now um, in patent pending, so you can actually look that information up uh, so uh, he does all of the builds himself. So it is not a commercially available platform that you can get off the shelf. Um, it's all, it's actually a 3D printed shell over top of the little arms there. Um, it is based on a, um, a typical autopilot system, but otherwise everything is done um, here in house. Uh, when you looked at the picture of the copter sign, you might've noticed it had a kind of funny little face with a hole in the front. Um, that's where all those instruments are. Um, and that's actually what keeps them protected from the elements and aspirated appropriately. Uh, but a lot of research has gone into that um, in order to make sure that they are appropriately placed um, to get the best data available. And there are some publications out there that Tony and his colleagues have done uh, to make sure that that's done in the best way possible for our data. Um, so we're really excited to be um, working with Tony and working with the CopterSon team uh, to use that platform because it is unlike any other platform that we can get off the shelf. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Smith. I think that looks like it's all the questions we've had for this section and we're pretty much right on our schedule. So I'm going to turn it back over to Kelly uh, to move into the next section of the program. All right. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, we are. Um, uh, thank you for everybody who um, is sticking with us. We, I, we know there's a lot that we're presenting here, but there are so many different um, parts to this project that we really wanted to highlight as many as we could. So we're going to learn about a few more instruments involved in perils. Chris Weiss is a professor of atmospheric science at Texas Tech University and has been involved with field observations of severe thunderstorms for the past 25 years. He has been closely involved with prior Vortex projects, including Vortex 2 and the Vortex Southeast project. Chris grew up in Michigan, and even though he studies tornadoes for a living, he didn't actually see his first one until he was 23. I like that fun fact, Chris. <laughs> Tell us about the stick nets, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kelly, for that uh, introduction. So today I'm gonna to be talking about the uh, stick net instrumentation. If we could go on to the first slide. Uh, so when I say stick net, I'm referring to uh, an array of 24 surface weather uh, stations. On the right-hand side, you can actually see uh, the components of a stick net instrument. We uh, can monitor wind, uh, temperature, relative humidity, uh, pressure. We even have a compass on board so that we don't have to sit there and try to, uh, to orient the, the probe uh, the correct direction when we're kind of under duress when the storm is upon us. And it's, all this sits on top of a, an engineering or, or surveyor's tripod here that you see on the right-hand side. Um, so uh, Sean Waugh is going to talk about the mobile mesonuts here shortly. I think it's after my talk. And that, that's a vehicle-borne instrument that uh, follows the storms and makes uh, measurements. And, and there you have a, a high temporal window where you can stay in about the same spot, storm relative, and make measurements uh, for, from specific spots. Uh, our, I like to think StickNet complements that strategy where we have a narrower window where we make our measurements, uh, but it's more distributed. Uh, so we get this uh, kind of mapping, this comprehensive uh, mapping of the storm over that window. Uh, so that's uh, what we're looking forward to in perils. Um, so we, we, we sample very frequently at 10 hertz. Uh, they're designed for rapid deployment. So when we're on our game, uh, two to three minutes, and then we're in the truck and off to the, to the next uh, location. And we have two trailers that we use to deliver these probes out uh, in the field. And also we can uh, recharge uh, the, the, um, the probes and download data while we're in transit. All right, next slide, please. 
So during uh, Perils, uh, I think previous speakers had mentioned this, uh, when we started this, the, these seminal efforts of Vortex SC in 2016 and 17, uh, we kind of had this postage stamp over northern Alabama and southern Tennessee, and we decided, you know, we needed to, to, to reduce our risk, essentially, and, and capture as many events as we could. So we, uh, we expanded out to these, uh, I guess, 10 subdomains over the southeast where radar sighting was, was, uh, was favorable. And uh, we've been scouting for a couple years now, and we have uh, over 200, I think we almost have 250 contacts now. Uh, uh, landowners across the southeast that are working with us. So we're really, uh, we're really excited to have this buy-in from the community uh, uh, for, for this project for the next couple of years. And when we get to the point where we're, uh, we're starting our, our, our deployments, we'll do this in a series of, of two waves, I guess you could say waves. Uh, we'll take uh, 16 of our 24 probes and we'll lay them out in, in a broader network, uh, what we call a mesoscale network, maybe 75 miles or so on a side uh, in, in a box. And the goal here, and this would be laid out probably maybe you know 24 hours or so, or starting 24 hours prior to the arrival of severe storms. And the idea here is to get an understanding of the environmental heterogeneity uh, that we think is so crucial to the uh, development of, um, of tornadoes along these quasi-linear convective systems. And then uh, when we get closer to the event, uh, maybe within an hour or two, we'll start this uh, deployment of this uh, shorter fused uh, network that's, uh, that's much narrower uh, maybe maybe 10 mile segment, something like that, maybe less than that, even if we're confident, and, and the spacing maybe more like a mile between probes. And the idea here is is uh, is really to get get a handle on the storm scale variability, uh, especially as, as the thunderstorm cold pool comes through, and, and then we can uh, we can say something about the heterogeneities in the cold pool on the storm scale and how that contributes to the to the tornado development. Uh, last slide, please. So our, our science goals for uh, for perils, uh, you can actually see a, a picture of one of our deployments in 2017 in northern Alabama, a quasi-linear convective system. You can see this kind of arcing of the, the clouds uh, into the background there. And if there was going to be a tornado, I know it'd probably be where that where that kind of wraps up into the background, where you see that slightly lower cloud base back there. Um, and uh, the blue arrow here indicates the cold air uh, from the uh, from the severe thunderstorm. And uh, we understand that that's critical for the propagation of, of the system. And also we think the tornado development as well. Um, oops, there we go. Um, we have done some research here at, uh, at Tech uh, involving numerical simulation. You could see in the upper right, uh, so some, uh, some cross sections, just like you basically took a butter knife and ran it through the plane of this, this picture on the left-hand side. And looking across the, these QLCSs and the blue, represents the intensity of the cold pool, how, how cold it is. And I'm sure everybody on the call here has felt the cold rush of air from thunderstorms before. But you can see a lot of variability between those two. We think it's those variations that are, are pretty important for, uh, for the tornado development. And that's why we're so keen on sampling it uh, with, with the Sticknet instruments. All right, I think I put me right at five minutes, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be quiet and I'll take questions in the Q&A session here in a little bit. Thank you so much, Chris. Our next presenter is Sean Waugh. He is a research meteorologist at the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory. Early in his career at the lab, he began designing and building the mobile mesonet vehicles used for research. Over the years, he and others modified the design to include new features and new vehicles. Being able to work with his hands and solve problems that don't have answers are some of the best things he loves about his job. In addition, getting to use these vehicles for research to try and solve problems that affect everyone is a key motivation for Sean and why he has such a passion for what he does. He has probably seen close to 50 tornadoes and been through several hurricanes, which definitely keeps the adrenaline high. Definitely. Tell us more, Sean. Hi, thanks for that introduction, Kelly. <clears throat> so Chris's talk was actually a perfect lead in to what I'm gonna be talking about now, which is a mobile version of the Sticknet known as a mobile mesonet. And about 30 years ago, scientists involved in the original Vortex project knew that they wanted to take observations in and around tornadic thunderstorms, but they pretty quickly realized that those storms move and they need to be able to move with those environments and continue sampling throughout its life cycle in order to really understand that. And, and because of that desire, 
the concept of a mobile mesonet or a mobile research station was sort of born. Now, back in the early 90s, we had smaller sedan type vehicles. We've obviously grown quite a bit since then. We've added new technology and new capabilities. We're currently driving larger pickup trucks, which give us a lot more flexibility on things. But these platforms have become extremely flexible and versatile tools that we have within our arsenal to study you know, severe weather events like the ones that we're going to be studying in perils. Uh, next slide, please. So similar to the stick nets that Chris talked about, these vehicles are capable of making the same type of surface observations that the stick nets do, you know, wind speed and wind direction. And our anemometer can measure winds all the way up to about 220 miles an hour. Now it won't take debris uh, much above about 80. So, you know, we can, we can observe wind speeds that high, but we have to be careful where we place those types of things. We actually have two different temperature sensors on there because the different sensors work differently in different environments. And we want to make our observations as accurate and as meaningful as possible. We measure relative humidity and dew point. We also have pressure observations. And all of these observations combined give us a really good sense of what's going on at the surface underneath some of these severe weather events. And it's those conditions that are sort of driving the force behind the severe weather events that we've all experienced in our lifetimes. Now that surface observation is one small piece and, and like you're probably getting the sense throughout these different talks, it requires a variety of observations from multiple angles and multiple levels within the atmosphere to really understand what's going on. And Dr. Coniglio earlier talked about launching wind balloon or wind radio sons or weather balloons into severe weather events. And we can actually do that from the back of these vehicles. Uh, which was a technology and a capability that we added a few years ago. And it's really given us a lot of flexibility to put those observations where we need them to be. Now, some of you that were watching the video play in the background there may have noticed with a sharp eye, these vehicles have quite a structure on top of them. In addition to the observations, there's a giant cage on top. And we have that specifically to protect the windshields from the, the hail that comes along with a lot of severe weather events. You know, We have to take observations in some areas that most people don't want to intentionally drive their cars. And you know, while I like dents on cars, I don't necessarily like replacing the windshield every day. So we've actually tested that hail cage up to about four and a half inches in diameter. Uh, and it, it works very, very well. So next slide, please. Now, these vehicles, like I said earlier, are very versatile and have a lot of flexibility and a lot of different uses. We use them severe, for severe weather, but we also use them for hurricanes, uh, mountain flows, boundary layer type flows, even winter weather events. Whatever research objective that we have here at the National Severe Storms Laboratory or within NOAA as a whole, you know, we can use these vehicles to take those observations. And, and they allow us to take observations that kind of follow the environment, which means we can kind of you know, handpick where we want to take those those observations as we're studying, you know, different weather events. Now, all equipment, like you might think, does take a considerable amount of effort and time to build these. We can't order these vehicles, you know, from the factory with a storm chaser package. We have to design and build all this equipment ourselves, and they get a lot of wear and tear over the years. The map that you see there is actually one small field project that we did showing you kind of the route that we drove throughout that project. So we do see a lot of mileage on these vehicles, but they give us a lot of good data after that. And with that, I'll uh, stop there. Thank you, Sean. Um, our next presenter, Vanna Molesky, is a research scientist with CERO, the, the NOAA's Cooperative Institute in Norman, and works in support of the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory. Vanna specializes in lightning uh, from improving our ability to observe and predict lightning to improving our understanding of what it reveals about the processes occurring within thunderstorms. Vanna was born in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and was fascinated by weather and storms as a kid, but did not decide she wanted to, be, quote, be a meteorologist when she grew up until she was in high school. Tell us about the lightning mapping array, Vanna. Oh, thank you, Kelly. So uh, one of the things that often comes with thunderstorms that we haven't really talked about yet is the lightning and the storms themselves. Uh, in the research mode, we can get a lot of information on lightning that can tell us a little bit more about what's happening in the storms with what's known as a lightning mapping array, which is a collection of several different instruments. Um, in our case, we're using a mobile network of eight different um, radio sensors. They're very high frequency or VHF radio frequency sensors. They're entirely passive, so they're just listening to the radio signals that are emitted by lightning. And yes, lightning does emit radio signals. Uh, the instrument is shown over here on the right side of the screen, and that's made up of a VHF radio antenna at the top, and then we also have a cell antenna for real-time communications. And we have a GPS antenna, unlike the GPS antenna that Sean Wall was just talking about, we're using our GPS um, 
mostly for timing. So we have really precise timing of when the lightning is happening. And then of course we have our solar panel to power everything and everything else uh, below that. These sensors are placed about 12 to 20 miles apart from each other uh, in the area that we're expecting storms to be before the passage of the storms themselves. Um, like uh, Dr. Chris Weiss mentioned, we're also working with a lot of local landowners, uh, including some schools and cities who are willing to host our instruments uh, when we're expecting storms in the area. And we're really grateful for all of the partners we've been able to work with out in the area. Uh, this is actually the first time that we'll be deploying one of these um, networks entirely mobily to study storms. So we're really excited to see how this will all work out and how we can feed into our better understanding of the storms in general. Once we have this array down, it can monitor all of the lightning over the surrounding 60 miles from where we have our instruments themselves. And then we are also working with some partners at NASA who operate uh, one of these arrays permanently in Northern Alabama. So there are permanent measurements being made uh, the same way that complement the observations we're taking mobily with the rest of the crews that are out on parallels. Next slide. So what does the data look like? Uh, it looks like what's shown here on the right. Uh, so this is what you might see with the naked eye. Uh, if you were looking at lightning and there weren't a cloud in the way, except we're only seeing points along those lightning channels. So on the bottom panel of the animation, there's a lightning flash like you were looking at it from the top of the storm. And then the upper panel is showing the lightning flash from the side of the storm. So both of them are showing the same, same lightning flash uh, and it's animating with time. And you can see the branching structure like what you expect lightning to look at. You can also see how deep the lightning flash is and a lot of other details along the lightning flash itself. If you compare this to what you might be more familiar with looking at lightning data, maybe you see A points on a radar screen or the area that's emitting light from satellite, we're seeing a lot more detail and we can see thousands of these points that are emitting those radio signals along the lightning flash in a single second, whether that's in one flash or multiple flashes at the same time. So we get a whole lot of the detail on what's happening on the lightning flash with really high accuracy. Uh, so we know where most of the lightning channels are to about the area the size of the football field. That's not what our uncertainty is. So we have a lot of high details on these lightning flashes. Uh, next slide. When we're looking at these uh, in the case of an entire storm altogether, uh, we're not looking at one flash at a time. We're looking at how all of the flashes in the storm are interacting with each other and where they are all together. So the animation here is three hours of an MCS passage over Oklahoma and all of the lightning that that was producing along the way. So there is a whole lot of lightning flashes and we're collecting that same data at that same detail but now we're looking at a whole lot more flashes and we already know some really useful things about lightning. We know that we can use lightning to monitor how a storm is evolving. You see a lot of really small flashes near the storm updraft and they tend to be a lot more frequent when the storm is strengthening. So we know that how the lightning is changing can tell us whether we see a strengthening updraft or weakening one. Um, but there's other things about lightning as well. We know that lightning depends on how precipitation is forming aloft in the storm. Uh, so the big question is the precipitation eventually is going to fall to the ground and that's going to bring that rain cooled air with it and form that cold pool that was just talked about by um, both Chris and Sean that's being measured by these surface instruments. Uh, but since that precipitation is forming aloft and that's impacting where our lightning is, is there something we can use in the lightning to tell us where we expect variations in that cold pool from that rain cooled air? They're going to be important for where and where we might not be expecting tornadoes to form along these storm systems. So that sums up the lightning observations that we'll be making in the project. And I'll turn it back to you, Kelly. Thank you so much, Vanna. Uh, we put our next speaker last on the agenda because she will discuss research activities that are happening after the storm. Dr. Melissa Wagner, a research scientist with CRO, is working in support of the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory. Melissa has a background in remote sensing and geography, focusing on land cover change and impacts. Her research uses UAS technologies and geospatial methods to study damage from tornadoes and high winds in rural areas and better understand severe storm dynamics in the southeastern United States. Melissa, tell us more. Thank you, Kelly. So, next slide. 
So I'm using uh, UAS technologies in conjunction with geospatial methods in order to better characterize high wind damage in rural areas and to vegetation. So if a tornado hits a structure, we're able to be able to see the damage, but it, say if it ha hits an open field, it can be difficult to identify where the tornado damage path was. Also something else is that there are very, much, there are very limited damage indicators for vegetation, which makes it difficult to infer tornado intensity. By using UAS technologies, we're able to gain, also gain access in remote locations such as forested areas and be able to identify where the tornado damage path had gone. So something that you're thinking of is why is this important? Well, if we can, by better documenting high wind damage, we get a better understanding of the severe storm risk in these areas. And this has implications for disaster preparedness as well as changing demographics in the Southeast US as more people are moving out into the rural areas. And by correlating the storm signatures that we see in the observational data sets, such as radar, with the UAS damage information, we can gain a better understanding of severe storm dynamics in the Southeast US. And the UAS imagery that we can collect, we can also share this with National Weather Service weather forecast offices, as well as local emergency managers, which can help in their damage assessments. This can be particularly useful for a better um, allocation of resources for disaster response, as well as recovery. Next slide. So for our UAS damage surveys, we are using a combination of two platforms. We've got a, a, a Skydio 2, which is a quadcopter, and that allows us to be able to uh, get the area extent of the tornado damage path. We also have a fixed wing UAS uh, with a Trinity F90 made by Quantum, which is not shown, and this has uh, two payloads, so it has a visible camera and a multi-spectral camera. And the nice thing about the multi-spectral camera is that it allows us to be able to better detect damage to vegetation that we otherwise wouldn't see. So if we look at the two images on the right and compare, the multi-spectral, we can see more damage to vegetation in the cornfield as indicated by the lighter green hues. Uh, next slide. So by better document, documenting high wind damage, so we're going to be using a combination of UAS and, as well as high resolution uh, satellite imagery. And so we're using multispectral analyses, 3D models, in order to also investigate and try to better understand the role of land cover in these impacts. Particularly, we can also look at the influence of terrain on tornado behavior. We'll also do numerical model, modeling to in order to improve the near surface wind speed estimations that are beyond the built environment. And lastly, we'll also be doing uh, using a cloud computing platform so that we can process the imagery in the cloud so that we can share and uh, use a GIS uh, platform for visualizations. So we can share this information with our partners. So with the National Weather Service forecast offices, local emergency managers, as well as FEMA. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you, thank you, Melissa. Stay on because it's time for questions. Um, Chris and Sean and Vanna will join you. And Alan, um, uh, I did, before you start, Alan, I did want to point out to everyone that the chat box, you put some links in the chat box um, to some of the data. And then uh, I put in a link to the project webpage where we will have more links in the future. So, Alan, uh, do we have some questions? Thanks, Kelly. We do have an initial question, and I certainly encourage uh, folks to add additional questions. Uh, a series of really interesting talks. I'm sure some people have some questions out there, but the first question is a pretty straightforward one. Uh, how many mobile mesonets will be used in the project? I guess that means I have to answer that one. Uh, <clears throat> we currently have three vehicles in this project, and by we, I mean the National NOAA's National Severe Storms Laboratory. Uh, we have three vehicles that have mobile mesonet rack assemblies uh, from our division, but I do know that there are other agencies that are involved in perils that have their own mobile mesonets. I'm actually not sure, uh, Alan, you might actually know what the total number of mesonets is, or Chris might know, somebody else might have a better count of what the rest of them are. 
uh, Tony actually provided me with that information. He says there are seven, uh, two NSSL, four University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and one University of Alabama Huntsville. And then, of course, I mean, Chris's, but it's not Chris's is a mobile mesonet per se. So it's kind of a different, different thing. Uh, let's see, I have another question. This is, well, this is for anybody. Uh, are there more locations or schools needed for the lightning data collection? Well, I didn't see they said lightning, so I guess it's for Vanna. <laughs> We are always looking for uh, new potentials. Some of them may be noisier in the radio noise than necessary. So please feel free to reach out to me. You can reach me at lightning at ou.edu um, and let's chat. Well, Chris, I'll, I'll ask a question for you. Um, I, I know, um, I wonder if you could just give a quick history of the sticknet uh, you know, how often you guys have used this in the past when you started the Sticknet uh, project and, um, you know, just kind of a, a brief overview of that, because I think some people would be interested, especially from some of the hurricane perspective and whatnot that you all have done. Yeah, yeah, we've, uh, we built these back uh, right before Vortex too, so that would have been circa 2008-ish, yeah. I guess, uh, where we were, uh, we were trying to, we realized the need in that Vortex 2 project to have widespread, you know, simultaneous surface measurements, and we we went through a few iterations on that design. But I think we even had something akin to a tiki torch kind of concept at one point, where we're javelining things into the the ground. But um, yeah, obviously there there are issues with high winds uh, with, with that 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 method. But yeah, out of a class project, we we kind of had uh, a few students working on this. We combine our own thoughts in there, and we. Uh, we came up with this prototype, which has changed a little bit, but not a whole lot. Yeah, we've used them in hurricanes, uh, mapping hurricane to uh, landfall landfalls. Uh, we actually have 48 total. We're only using 24 for for, for this project right here. But uh, yeah, we've used them for uh, a clear air work uh, before thunderstorms form on some of our initiating boundaries. There's there's a lot lot of uses for them for sure. I, I meant to mention, Alan. I there was a question from an earlier session uh, from Lincoln County, Tennessee. I have a strange feeling that one might have been directed uh, towards me because <laughs> I was talking with them about some uh, sticknet locations up there. If that was the case, I'll, I'll be back in touch with you because uh, we still do need some spots up there. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, well. All the presentations so far have, well, have just been great, in my opinion, and um, we've had a lot of great questions and discussion, and I'd like to ask the uh, uh, all the presenters to turn their cameras back on so that we can just have a, we can kind of wrap up here with just some general questions uh, that folks might have for the entire group. And as people are popping on, uh, a first question that uh, um, maybe Tony or Eric would, might like to take is somebody asked what the process is by which we make a decision to do a uh, an intense operating or observation uh, period, an IOP, and what the timeline is for that. All right, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and take this. So uh, we have a briefing slot scheduled within the project for noon every day that uh, we started, started and took a little break given the quiet pattern. We started that last week and we'll be resuming that tomorrow in anticipation of the, the pattern change that looks to be coming this weekend. Um, but basically what will happen is all the participants are invited onto this, uh, this briefing. And then we'll discuss the forecast for about a week out from, from each uh, each day of the briefing. And then if there is a storm system that looks like it has a potential to produce severe weather in the perils domain, about four days out, we will make the call that either yes, we're going to operate on it or no, we won't. We won't decide exactly where in the perils domain we'll be at that point, but we'll, it'll be a yes or no, we're gonna go or we're not gonna go. And then about two days out or so, 
is when we'll make the decision on where within the perils domain we will set up. So it's kind of this, this two-step process. Yes, we're going to deploy. No, we're going to, not going to deploy. And then what part of the perils domain we're going to deploy in if we uh, deploy. And, and that has, this is so that we can facilitate making sure all the equipment gets out into the areas that it needs to go into. And then, then making the final decision, waiting on that, ensures that we can use the best possible forecast information that we have while still facilitating uh, the deployment of all these instruments, which will take, in some cases, probably 12 to 18 hours at minimum ahead of the arrival of storms to get into place, and, and in some cases more, plus all the time it takes to travel to those areas. So it's quite an intensive process when you're dealing with, with this load of instrumentation and, and the complexities in getting it all deployed. All right, thanks, Tony. Did anybody else want to comment just from their particular perspective on the deployment and decision process? Okay. Um, well, we have one other que uh, question that I think is a broad question for the entire group, and I imagine we would get some different perspectives from different people but it's how will you measure the success of this project? And obviously some of you have very specific goals. Some of you have broader goals. Um, we have the broader goals of uh, Vortex Southeast, which is really to try to reduce the societal impact of uh, tornadoes and severe weather in the Southeast. But I wonder if any, any of you have some uh, specific comments you'd like to make. Sure, I'll, I'll take a run. I think. Uh, sure, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, going back uh, to you know when we started this out in sixteen and seventeen, um, as I'd mentioned in my, my talk too, we we had this kind of narrow area that we were sampling over, and we just didn't have a whole lot of events to work with. Uh, I think um, and this is what's going to change in, in perils is we'll have a much higher sample size, and uh, specifically we're going to be able to discriminate uh, better. I think you know what you know what portions of the line are non-tornadic, what portions are weakly tornadic, and maybe even some, some some stronger tornadoes that occur in portions of that line. We haven't really been able to to do that with a large sample set yet. So I think uh, I think we're certainly set up for success. And it's an obvious metric metric of success is is you know having a large sample size that comes out of this two-year project. Of course, after that, the uh, you know the benefits through you know publication and, and presentations uh, at conferences and, and and of course, uh, eventually, what works its way to operations to uh, to benefit the warning process and save lives. Yeah, that's a it's a, that's a good and tough and interesting question. There, there's so many ways to measure success, but um, something I'll be looking for over the next five to ten years as the data gets studied and understood is, um, are we able to start seeing some signs? of tornado formation that are maybe 15, 20, or 30 minutes, or maybe even a little bit more ahead of the tornado itself, because where we're kind of stuck right now is, uh, is we, we're watching for the actual development of the tornado on radar. And at that point, you know, you push, you, you issue the warning and, and you haven't provided a whole lot of lead time. And it turns out that, especially in the Southeast with so many of the uh, unusual problems down there in terms of housing and sheltering and things like that, that a lot of people really need a, a more time to prepare for an oncoming tornado. I mean, there's people that need 30 minutes or an hour. So uh, that'll be fun to see. I think I think we'll get it, uh, but that, I think that'll be one big thing we can measure to see if we can actually start to provide useful information out there at, at 30 minutes or more before our tornado forms. Yeah, I, I think to build off what Eric said, I think success will be measured in the margins. So I presented those three kind of thrusts of the project, the environment, the storm, and the aftermath. I think our success will be in the margins in between those categories. How we, what we learn in the interaction between the environment and the storm, and what we learn 
in terms of the aftermath and what's left behind in the wake of these storms and how what we learn about how the aftermath, how the damage gets produced, I, I think that's less well understood than a lot of people realize. And so I think this, this is certainly the, the best project I, I'm aware of to actually under uh, investigate and understand those transition points in, in the life cycle of an event. And I think what we, how much we gain out of those, that environment storm interaction, and then learning about how the damage occurs and, and the aftermath left behind, I think how much we learn out of that is going to be our one of our true gauges of success. I definitely think you know that's a good measure in terms of you know science success, but especially in the first year of the project, um, one big measure of success is going to be successfully collecting the quality data. Um, you know, this environment is very difficult, um, and getting out there and successfully collecting quality, good data every time is going to be a huge measure of success because that is a big hurdle that we all have to work together to overcome. I think we're going to have to end on that. I think that was a great question and some great answers. And uh, uh, that does wrap our today's uh, webinar on the Perils Tornado Research Project. As we end, please stay on for one more minute to answer a few brief questions that will appear on your screen. It's the first time we've done this and your feedback really is helpful. A big, big, big thanks to all of our wonderful panelists today, as well as James Renan, who provided technical assistance, Alan Gerard, who helped with questions, as well as you, our audience. Uh, I hope you have learned something new. Thanks for your participation and have a fine day.